James chapter 1, verse 1, James, the servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ to the 12 tribes in the dispersion greetings. An introduction to the letter of James. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this call. Wonderful privilege to just walk through Scripture, and it just has so many benefits, Lord. What it does, though, primarily, the great benefit of it, it is allows your people to hear more of you and less of the preacher. And so you, when we walk through large sections of Scripture, then we don't have to question whether or not we've heard God, because as the Scriptures ha- are being read, we've heard God. And so I ask you, Lord, to bless us during this, this time in James. May it be uh, fruitful for our church and our families, and uh, may your name be praised. We love you and we thank you. So we, after, as as I said, after quite a bit of prayer, we have decided to uh, walk through the epistle of James, another word for letter, the letter written by James as he writes here to the 12 tribes in dispersion. And we'll, in the dispersion, we'll quickly talk about that. That's not as deep as it, as it sounds. Um, uh, And so we'll, we'll work our way through that. But we really, if you join me in the notes, uh, we really felt impressed here. This is one of those ones where I was really aiming at uh, maybe starting at Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1, or maybe Galatians, uh, and really felt, but I just, it just kept coming back and coming back and coming back until I finally just kind of yielded. So I I hope you all are really blessed as we walk through this epistle. Often called the Proverbs of the New Testament, the book of James practically and faithfully reminds Christians, and if you're following along with me, as you're filling, those of you visiting, we do these fill in the blanks to try to aid in, uh, in comprehension, give you some stuff to do with family worship and so forth. So hope that's still being a blessing. But uh, James practically and faithfully reminds Christians how to live. Somebody say how to live. And that's really what seems to be James's focus uh, as, he, as he writes. From perseverance to true faith, even to such practical matters as controlling one's tongue, to submitting to the will of God. How many of you know that's a good thing to submit to God's will? Since we're being transparent, those of you who are in prayer at 930, we've been very transparent in prayer. Thank you all for coming so strongly to prayer today as well. But how many of you recognize that submitting to God's will is wonderful amen material, but it's very hard to do? Anybody willing to acknowledge that that's difficult. Yeah, so James is going to exhort us uh, in that as well. Uh, He's going to exhort us by the Spirit to have patience, uh, and this book aids readers in really where I think our church needs to go, and I think this is why the Lord is pressing us in to read through this, but to live authentically and wisely for Christ, to live authentically. That's a quote from one of my ESV Bibles, but it was just a really good quote. It kind of sums up Uh, what James is really after. Again, I searched in my heart and prayed to Christ for what the church needs right now. That's what a pastor does. And what, Lord, what do you want your people to to hear and and to learn and so forth? And uh, again, this letter just kept coming up. And I've asked myself why a little bit, why? And uh, as we read through James, I think we'll begin to see it. But in short, we're a church that has learned a lot. Very heavy on learning. How many of you agree that we're very heavy on learning? Okay, we, I mean, there is, some of y'all got, I mean, there's notes and books and, and teaching times. I mean, there's a lot of equipping, equipping, equipping. So we know a lot. But I feel in my heart that, that as good as that is, we must transition to a church that not only knows a lot or has learned a lot, but also lives a lot. And there's your feeling. We must transition to a church that doesn't just know or hadn't just learned a lot, but we must now apply what the Lord has taught us to live a lot, where we take what we have learned and we actually apply it. We know that when we don't do that, when we just gain a bunch of knowledge and it never works its way out into humble application, we learned in 1 Corinthians that that sort of knowledge then puffs up. And it becomes destructive. Uh, I've said so many times that one of the worst things that can happen to a person that actually loves the church and loves God is to fall into this pattern of, 
I learn, 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 I never do. Because that's, that's a very dangerous place to be. And James actually talks about that, as we'll see. He says, don't just be a hearer of the word, but be a doer. Because hearers who don't transition to become doers deceive themselves. It's a tough place to be. So we don't want to do that. We want to be a church that takes all this knowledge and all these things, these good things that God has given us, and we want to, we want to apply those things uh, and live those things out. Um, and our, as Elder hinted to our particular call as a local congregation, every congregation is the Lord is saying, here are the things that all I want all my church to do, and here are the things that I want you in particular to press on, just like us as individuals. Well, our particular call kind of demands that we walk a certain way. Otherwise, if I could just be honest with you, we're going to get torn up. And then the elders and I, we've been kind of, in the past, we've been kind of talking about this, that just based on who CRCC is, you know, we're kind of headed towards the front of the battle. So if you get up, to, how many of you know if you, if you get up to the front of the battle, I mean, you're not in the back with the supplies <laughs> where you can kind of, you know, play cards and play solitaire and work your nine to five. But if you, the closer you get to the front of the fight where stuff is happening, the more kind of locked into what the mission is you need to be. Otherwise, you're going to measure, what are we doing? And boom, right? And so I even tell people, I said, look, I, even some of the folks coming to join church, I said, hey, you know, just understand you're coming into a hot environment. This is an environment where warfare is very high almost all the time. Uh, and, and so our call, I hope you hear my heart a little bit this morning. This is James, I think is going to really help us. But our call is we, we, we have to kind of transition from knowing a lot to applying what the Lord has given us. And I think that's, that's kind of, that's called growth, isn't it? Isn't that called growing? How many of you all have taught your children a lot? How many of you want them, just by virtue of your teaching them, how many of you want them to go beyond the teaching and on to the doing? Okay, well, is the Lord any different? So I think that's kind of why, because James is exhorting the doing. He's exhorting the, he's exhorting overall, hey, Christian, I know, I know there's a lot going on. I know there's persecution happening in the time that he was writing, but here's what you have to do. And so I think we'll see that theme over and over again. Again, if this particular church doesn't understand that it will be a spiritual blockage for us, if we're going to attack these black gates and all these things that we're talking about and reform family and all these wonderful things, but we will be blocked up and hemmed up if we just have all that up here, but it never kind of transitions uh, to the doing. Uh, it'll be a wall for us. It'll be a hard place for us. And it'll be a place where Satan can get his foot in. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 27 tells us to give no opportunity or give no place to the devil. We just don't want to, we just don't want to do that. Okay. As a husband, I know that if I don't follow God's instructions on being a husband, I give an opportunity or place to the devil to get in my marriage. I'm not trying to do that. My wife knows that if she didn't follow God's instructions for being a wife, that she gives place, she gives opportunity or place to the devil to get in. And so James then is one of these books that exhorts the doing. It really does. And so he's so practical. That's why it's called the Proverbs of the New Testament. He's so practical, in fact, and he speaks with such authority that you might even be shocked by some of the verses where he's just like, do this and make you do that and do that. You know, and, and so that's what it is. It really is an exhortation to follow along the path of knowledge and transition from just having knowledge to also applying it rightly, which is wisdom. And that wisdom comes from above. And we'll see that. As we, as, we go through, as we go through James. Now, the truth is, again, if we kind of sort of wander out on the battlefield, you know, kind of la-di-da, you know, it, it's going to be tough. But if we are steadfast, somebody say steadfast, and if we decide to be immovable and if we begin to abound in the work of the Lord, I believe he's going to help us. I'm just determined to, in love and grace, follow Christ. And I believe the Lord will use us if we do so. Remember our prayer exhortation this morning was to deny ourselves, to pick up our crosses, and to follow after him. And I believe, I believe he'll use us. So let's just start with a little history to make sure we properly introduce the letter. That's why I only read the first verse. We'll talk briefly about it, but this is really more of an overview of the letter. And then we'll start in earnest next week in verse two, where we may spend a week or two talking about joy. Somebody say joy. We we'll really kind of unpack what joy is and really Hopefully be encouraged through that starting next week. Today's more of an overview. So the question is, who wrote the letter? Who wrote the letter? As is often the case uh, in the Bible, the letter is named, the, the letter is really named uh, James because James is literally the author. This epistle is thought by the majority 
of scholars to be written by James, also called James the Just. Uh, he was the half-brother of Christ our Lord. Uh, and so obviously he wasn't his full brother, but he was the half-brother. He, he was the later on child, uh, along with others, of Mary and Joseph. Uh, Matthew 13, verse 55, is this not the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary? And are not his brothers James and Joseph, Simon and Judas, also called Jude, where we get another letter in the Bible? This is the same James who, along with the rest of Jesus' siblings, at one time did not believe that Jesus was the Christ. It's one of the things that I want you to note about verse number one. He didn't call himself, you know, Jesus' little brother. He says, servant of Jesus Christ. And how many of you know that? That's, that's tough. It's tough. You know that, that old phrase, familiarity breeds contempt? And you know the old mantra that some of the hardest people to minister to are people you're the closest to? Well, yeah, imagine shifting at one point from, you know, playing ball with Jesus on the playground to acknowledging him as Messiah. But apparently, by the grace of God, that's what happened to James. John 7 says it this way. So his brother said to him, leave here and go to Judea that your disciples also may see the works that you're doing. For no one works in secret if he seeks to be known openly. If you do these things, show yourself to the world. In other words, if you're is who you say you are, prove it. Verse 5 says, for not even his brothers believed in him. And so at one point, James was an unbeliever like the rest of us, right? And, and think about the context here. James grew up in Jesus' household. He was the child of Joseph and Mary. And I can just, you know, it makes you ask all these crazy questions like, did he and Jesus argue? Did he ever like take his finger and get Jesus on the ear like that? <laughs> you know, you know, when he was growing up, it makes you wonder because Jesus grew up like any other little boy, right? I mean, there was this, you know, did, did they wrestle? You know, and at some point, Jesus, you know, acknowledges and comes out and tells everybody who he is. Can you imagine, you know, not his mother and father, but his siblings going, what? You know, the same Jesus that when we raised that time, I won, but you said you won. The same one. Yeah, the same one. And so there was a, there was a point in time where his brothers, where his, where their, his siblings did not believe that he was the Messiah, even after his ministry started. And so James came a long way pretty quickly. Uh, in, his, in, his, uh, in his belief. The Lord saved him and the Lord called him and he became a great leader as we'll also talk quick, quickly about. Uh, again, after Christ's resurrection, James was likely among his brothers in the upper room. That's an inference, uh, but it's logical. Look at Acts chapter 1. And when they had entered, they went up to the upper room where they were staying, Peter and John and James, not the brother of this one, that will be the apostle, and Andrew, Philip, and Thomas, Bartholomew, and Matthew, James, the son of Alphaeus, the other apostle, and Simon, the zealot, and Judas, the son, of, the son of James. All these were with one accord, devoting themselves to prayer together with the women, and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and his brothers. So in that, and his brothers, is very likely that James, who again was not among the twelve, who was not one of the twelve apostles, he was probably there. So he was already at that time then acknowledging that his, bro that his brother was in fact Jesus the Messiah, not just Jesus, son of Joseph. For clarity, there are two note noteworthy James in the New Testament. Really, you can say three, but, but the one that we hear about most of the time is the apostle James, James, the son of Zebedee and the brother of John. Of course, James and John were part of the 12, and sometimes it gets confusing. But we're talking today about the letter we're about to read is James, the brother of Jesus. Okay, let us want to make that clear. Now, James the Just, as he is known, number three, eventually became the leader of the Jerusalem church. So James not only wrote a pretty, a pretty stern and forthright epistle, but history lets us know, and even the Acts of the Apostles in the New Testament lets us know that James became really what a lot of theologians call the first pastor or the first bishop of the church in Jerusalem. And I'll just, I'll, I wrote uh, put a few scriptures in here for you to take a look at as we're kind of introducing ourselves to the flow of, of this epistle and what hopefully God will do in our church as we walk through it. So if we look at Acts 12 here, I just want you to see how the other apostles 
and how the other leaders treated James. And you can see this rise from Jesus' brother who didn't believe to probably there in the upper room to really a leading voice to when the apostles went on missionary journeys, it was James and a group of elders there in Jerusalem holding the church down. And so it really did, he really did kind of come into what God had for him. Here's James, uh, Acts 12. But Peter continued knocking, and when they opened, they saw him and they were amazed. But motioning to them with his hand to be silent, he described to them how the Lord had brought them out of the prison And he said, tell these things to James and the brothers. And so we begin to see this acknowledgement, even amongst the 12, that James was someone to go to and report to and and kind of let know what was what was going on. Then he departed and went to another place. We see it again in Acts 15. All the assembly fell silent as they listened to Barnabas and Paul, as they related what signs and wonders God had done through them among the Gentiles After they finished speaking, guess who stood up? James. And James replied, brothers, listen to me. And if you read the account, of course they did. So you begin to see this transition again from one who didn't believe to one who was there and saw and was somewhere in there converted to one who is now leading with so so much authority that his letter is canonized in our Bible. Uh, Look at Acts 21. When we had come to Jerusalem, the brothers received us gladly. On the following day, Paul went in with us to James, and all the elders were present. And so even the apostle Paul, as great as he, great as he was, saw fit to come and let James know what was going on. 1 Corinthians 15, we read this very, very recently. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised, and on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, that he appeared to Cephas, Peter, then to the twelve. So we obviously know Peter had some authority amongst the apostles, the acknowledged leader of the twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom who are still alive, though some had fallen asleep. Then he appeared uh, to James and then to all the apostles. And so everybody saw him, but James again is lifted up and pointed out as one the Lord specifically went to. Galatians 1, uh, after three years, this is the Apostle Paul, after three years I went up to Jerusalem to visit Cephas or Peter and remained with him 15 days. But I saw none of the other apostles except James, the Lord's brother. So he's numbered then among this, this, given this apostolic title, even though he wasn't one of the 12. And of course, that just simply means one who was sent. So James then, again, even the Apostle Paul, with his great ministry, God calling him to the Gentiles, saw fit then to check in, but then make sure that he goes to James. Eusebius, a great historian, writes in his Ecclesiastical History, Volume 2, then James, whom the ancients surnamed the just, on account of the excellence of his virtue. And oh, by the way, that's what James was known for. James was known for virtue. He was known for truth. He was known for kind of towing the line, all right, and not not deviating to the left hand nor to the right. And so Eusebius writes, James, surnamed the just, on account of the excellence of his virtue, is recorded to have been the first to be made bishop of the church in Jerusalem. This James was called the brother of the Lord because he was known as a son of Joseph And Joseph was supposed to be the father of Christ because the virgin being betrothed to him was found only with child by the Holy Ghost before they came together as the account of the Holy Gospels show. And so, again, from the account of the the scriptures, which point to his authority, to the account of history, we see James then rising up then to become a pretty strong leader. The local congregation in Jerusalem was eventually, in my opinion, led by James and a group of elders as the apostles then took off. I mean, whether it was North Africa or out to the Galatian church or the the, uh, Gentile churches or to Rome, the apostles spread out of Jerusalem. James was left there in Jerusalem, stayed there in Jerusalem, was martyred there in Jerusalem. Is everybody with me so far? Okay, that's a history lesson, but I just, you know, when when, when we go into a letter like this, I just don't want to jump into, I want you to get a sense of who this person was and and how maybe the Lord used them and why. You know, James was a, obviously a Jew, grew up in the tradition of Jews like all the apostles did. 
But unlike the other apostles who, who spread out, he stayed and tried to uh, serve the congregation in Jerusalem, which would have been Jewish Christians primarily in all the things that that entailed and all the temptations and all the persecutions that that entailed. So he, his ministry wasn't quite easy, as we'll, as we'll see. But I wanted to point out to you some of these things because as we walk through James, you'll likely feel as if he's speaking with, with quite a bit of authority to these 12 tribes in the dispersion. And that's because he was their pastor. And I just kind of wanted you to see that because you so you wouldn't be taken aback by the authority with which he with which he speaks. OK, are you with me? All right. So when was this thing written real fast? James was there's some debate as usual, but James was likely written between some somewhere between 40 and 50 A.D. It's an early one. It's an early epistle, much like First Thessalonians. I mean, this is one that was it was written pretty early. Um, and to, in my view, it's a wonderful window into what the very first church was going through and some of the things that they, that they needed adjustment on. And, and so that's why I love it. And, uh, oh, the primitive church, that's your feeling, the primitive church. In other words, the early church. Uh, so it was written early. James himself was martyred in 62 AD, eight years before the temple came down. So he never, he never saw it, but he was killed eight years before that. And there are a few historical accounts as to how uh, Brother James died. The Fox's Book of Martyrs writes this concerning him. At the age of 94, <laughs> how's this for ending your ministry strong? At the age of 94, he was beaten stone by the Jews and finally had his brains dashed out with a fuller's club. It wasn't enough to be hit with rocks, but we're going we, we're, we're gonna to take a fuller's club then, an instrument of trade, and we're going to beat you with it. A little bit more detail coming from Eusebius. But after Paul, in consequence of his appeal to Caesar, had been sent to Rome by Festus, the Jews, being frustrated in their hope of entrapping him by the snares with which they had laid for him, turned against James, the brother of the Lord, to whom the Episcopal seat at Jerusalem had been entrusted by the apostles. The following daring measures were undertaken by them against him or James, leading, them, leading him into their midst. They demanded of him that he should renounce faith in Christ in the presence of all the people, but contrary to the opinion of all, with a clear voice and with greater boldness than they had anticipated, he spoke out before the whole multitude and confessed that our Savior and Lord Jesus is the Son of God. Somebody say hallelujah. How many know if, if you got to go, that's the way to go? Even if you got to go, I mean, and that's what we were talking about in prayer this morning, this, uh, this, this willingness on behalf of, of the Christian then to deny themselves, to take up their cross and follow. Friends, this was the call of the believer all the way from the beginning. And just because James was his brother, James didn't get off. He died similarly to many of the other apostles and many of the other early church saints. When, when the pressure was on, will you confess Christ? When the pressure is on, will we confess Christ? Love it. And I hope we're able. But when they were unable to bear, or unable to bear longer the testimony of the man who, on account of the excellence of ascetic virtue and of piety, with which he exhibited in this life, was esteemed by all as the most just of men. There's that title again, James the Just. And, and consequently, they slew him. Opportunity for this deed of violence was furnished by the prevailing anarchy, which was caused by the fact that Festus had just died at this time in Judea and that the province was without a governor and head. And so there was some taking advantage of socio-political realities. They saw an opportunity to take out old James, and they did. Okay. May I remind you one more time, friends, as we begin to get into some of the verses that, that we might want to pray about, that this is the call of the Christian. The call of the Christian, as much as we might want it to be for a comfortable, easy life, as much as we might want it to be for, uh, you know, for all of our dreams to come true, as much as we have fallen for the American dream and superimposed the American dream onto the, onto the Christian ethic, is simply not the case. The truth of the matter is, we're pilgrims and sojourners just passing through. And we're called, if necessary, to give our lives for the gospel of Jesus Christ. We're called to hold to what our Lord has told us and to, with as much love and grace as is possible, preach what he has told us to all of creation. 
We're called to in our personal devotions. We're called to in our homes. We're called to in our church. And yes, we are called to in the public sphere, represent Jesus the Christ in everything. We're called to repent quickly. We're, we're, we are called to uh, forgive quickly. We're called to a life of holiness and great joy therein. We're called to carry our crosses. We're called to live in a covenant community. We're, we're, we're called out of, as we're talking about, we're called out of the world. We're not called to blend into it. And so I get, it's kind of a history lesson. And you, you know, obviously take a look at your history books. And uh, if you've got some church history books, and there's, there's more detail out there about, about James. But his life then is this great testimony similar to a lot of ours of, of you know, being an unbeliever, some of you, most of you probably grew up in church and you were very familiar with church, but you can, how many know you can be an unbeliever even though you're very familiar with church? I mean, a lot of us, a lot of, matter of fact, for those of us who are actively doing family devotions and family worship, please understand your job is to expose your children to the gospel. Expose, you can't save them. God has to save them. And just because they're doing catechism with you doesn't mean they're saved yet. Okay, so, so, then, so then our job is to constantly preach and constantly expose and looking for fruit and looking for fruit. Well, James was in, drew up in the house with Jesus. I'm sure at some point Mary had to let it leak. I don't know, right? Maybe. Mama, why are you looking at Jesus like that with that smile on your face? You know, I don't know. But he was still an unbeliever all the way up until after the Lord started his ministry. And we fast forward to 62 AD and then he is murdered for the testimony that he presents. And Jesus has way long since been to James more than his big brother. But he is now Christ, King, and Messiah. That's the call, friends, to move beyond wherever we were by the grace of God, get to a place where we are literally willing to give our lives for Jesus. That's a tough call, isn't it? But in that place, we begin to learn that Jesus truly is enough. And one of the great, one of the great, I don't know, fallacies, problems, regrets, laments in the local church today, and indeed the church today, is that we are still slaves to our conveniences, and we are still wholly unwilling to give up a lot for Jesus. Not that giving up anything saves us, but it's still part of the, of the call. Are y'all hearing me? Okay, let's just press in a little bit more. Um, so I just wanted you to see a picture of the call in James and, uh, and also see that he rose by God's calling and grace to, to leadership, significant leadership. Who was this epistle written to? Writing from Jerusalem, James wrote to the 12 tribes in the dispersion uh, according to chapter 1, verse 1. This is Jewish language, 12 tribes, okay, and dispersion. This is, langu this is language to describe the church in Jerusalem. So he's talking to Jewish Christians, wherever they might be, particularly though in Judea, all right? Uh, so this is Jewish language written from the center of Judaism. So James is likely addressing his flock in Jerusalem and the surrounding areas, Judea and so forth. Jewish Christians attempting to live out their faith in the midst of rising persecution. There's your fill-in. Rising persecution. Remember, a little bit from some things we've talked about previously, number two, that by the mid-60s A.D., persecution against Christians had broken out all over the world. Mid-60s A.D., Nero was on the throne and was doing, of Rome. He was emperor and was doing his very best to slaughter Christians. Okay, so the persecution had broken out all over the world. And by 70 AD, the temple, the center of the spiritual world in Judaism, had come crashing down, burnt, destroyed totally by, Roman, by the Romans with massive, off-the-charts loss of life in Jerusalem. But even before these things happened, in the time where James was likely writing, Stephen had already been martyred likely in the mid-30s A.D. That happened very soon. James, the apostle, had been martyred. You read uh, in Acts chapter 12, verse 2, um, he'd already been killed, mid-40s or so A.D. Peter had already been imprisoned and, of course, miraculously 
escape by the hand of God. But I want you to see that the time in which he was writing, there was already death and carnage amongst the early Christians. Satan had already, un- he'd already unleashed everything he had at the church, and we were beginning then to see this church that had started with such power in Acts 2 come under immediate pressure. How, do you ever wonder how we would react if, if the uh, socio-political environment changed drastically in America to match that, let's say, in Nigeria right now, in parts of Nigeria, uh, where literally, if you're anywhere close to Boko Haram, you could die. Or in China, where it's been for you know, decades, or in, uh, uh, in, in parts of the Ukraine, or in parts of uh, what used to be the former Soviet bloc. Uh, I'm not trying to make anybody feel guilty. I'm just asking, have you ever, did you ever want, do you ever wonder how we would respond if we had to sneak in here today? You know, if we had to take the sign down and, uh, or if we couldn't even meet like this, we had to meet in homes. Or, uh, you know, if you, if, I mean, anyone ever wonder how we, if, if America stopped being a nation that tolerated our faith and we began to be increased, and many people say there are signs already that we're being pushed, and I, I agree. But it's still reasonably open. If I go out and street preach, I'm probably not going to get arrested. I might, but I probably won't, won't be. So, but have you ever wondered what it would be? James was writing to folks who, you know, whose, whose joy in the Lord of being saved and our Christ has risen. And we, many of them saw him and knew of him and, and saw him in the streets of Judea. That joy was still there, but they were still dealing with a, a persecution that was ramping up. It was, it was ramping up and it would, it would culminate in just a decade or so, but it was ramping up. All of a sudden now this guy named Saul bursts on the scene and he's going house to house, persecuting Christians and dragging them out. And have you ever wondered, I know I'm kind of just kind of talking from my heart a little bit today in this history lesson. But have you ever wondered how well we would do under such circumstances when, in general, such little things tend to knock us so far off? I, I wonder. I think, wow, I don't know. Like I was, <laughs> said in prayer this morning, I tweeted this or so I said it to somebody. I don't know. I was like, how are we? I don't know how we're going to take on demons and devils. I don't know how we're going to take on principalities and powers. When, when the small stuff just locks us down so hard. I don't know. We talk, we don't, we don't get take back from the devil. We ain't taking nothing back from the devil. If we can't just love each other, you can forget that. That ain't no chance. We ain't got no chance to do that. We're going to take it on. We're going to cast the devil. Look, that folk who do that kind of stuff are walking in a, in, in a dead life. They're walking in a way where, where they have really, uh, you know, I'm going to give that up for you. Lord. I'll give that up for you, Lord. I'll give that, whatever. You just strip this down. Strip me down. Kill me if necessary. I mean, whatever. They are the ones that God ends up putting out there. And now I need you to go because your life is no longer precious to you. I'm precious to you. So I want us, I want us to get some of that from this because we, we often, many of us, and I would say most of us, as we look at the news, any of y'all are bold enough to watch the news these days, it's depressing. But it's depressing. Like, Lord, can I get a little joy? Turn it off. Turn it off. But, uh, but, but as we kind of look, oh, Lord, our schools, oh, Lord, our children, oh, Lord, our government, oh, Lord, the wars. And, and we got radical Islam on this side and apathy on this side and the dead and blah, 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 blah. And we kind of lament. But then at the same time, here's our hypocrisy and dysfunction. Once we're finished lamenting, we're really, as a culture, now I'm not talking about CRCC, as a Christian culture, we're really kind of not willing then to lay down the stuff that we're supposed to lay down and pick up the stuff that we're supposed to pick up. And so I wonder sometimes if God has withdrawn his power or if he's just waiting on a bunch of folk who will really give their all and just follow him. I don't know the answer to that, but it's something to think about. So James wrote it. Church was, persecution was ramping up when it was written, I think. Uh, you know, you history experts can can look at that, but I'm, I'm, I'm reasonably comfortable with saying that in that 40 to 50 to 60 AD is when this was written and persecution was certainly rising during that time. Uh, recall again that it really got bad at 70 AD, but before all of this, a whole lot of other folk were murdered. Why was this epistle written? Why did he write 
to his flock there in Jerusalem and other Jewish Christians. Of course, it applies to all Christians, but why, what was the impetus of the letter? Well, I'm, I've, gone, I've read it, so I've backed up a little bit after I've read it, and I'm giving you what I th- why I think he wrote it based on what he wrote, and we'll be the judge of that as we walk through together line by line. But James is a letter of pastoral encouragement, and frankly, if I can be honest with you, at sometimes rebuke. It seems that his flock, wherever they might be, had become, and I want you to really write this word down, because herein, I think, is one of our greatest lessons from James, had become a bit worldly. Mother said, huh? Elder said, my, my. Deacon said, huh? That's, That's confirmation for me. But they had become a bit worldly. May I suggest at the outset that we check our worldly meter as we walk through James? May I just suggest it? Just look at your name and say, he's just suggesting. May, may I just suggest that you and I take this opportunity as opposed to being mad at James to do so? You know, there, you have a couple of choices when you go to, when you go to a Bible teaching church. You can get mad at the scripture, or you can let the scripture change you. Because we're going to read this as it's written and just try to feel what the Lord wants us to learn and grow from. And so his flock had gotten a seem, a seemingly a bit worldly based on the stuff. I mean, he has to correct their t- I mean, you'll see, he's had to, but corrections that he almost seems like I shouldn't have to be saying this, but I have to, so I am. And I submit to you today, friends, that this issue of worldliness continues to be a huge problem in the Lord's church. We've been called out, but we want to stay in. Right? I mean, we've been been told, come out, we're trying to go in. We've, been say, we've heard, be separate. We've chosen something different. And so I believe it's a, we, you know, we know the script. James even says that friendship with the world, as we'll read, is enmity against God. So then if friendship with the world or the world system, the world structure and so forth, demonstrates hatred against God because the ecclesia, the church has been called out, then why we work so hard to, be, to cozy up to that which dishonors our Lord. It's, it's still, a, it's still a, in my opinion, it's still a really big problem with all of us. We are, as a church culture, in my opinion, extremely worldly. We take our cues from the world. We try to please the world. If the world invents a new music style, we jump on it. I'm just being transparent. I've done all these things, so I mean, I'm just, I'm just, I'm just examining myself here. If the world has a new whatever, we're in, and we just put Jesus' name on it. We interpret the word many times, not through the lens of a biblical worldview, but based upon what the world approves of. In other words, it's not what what I hear someone say this week. It was a quote, uh, and, and it's not what thus says the Lord anymore. It is, well, it seems to me. It, it's not, here's the book, bam, hoop, trip, hoop. You remember that old saying? Some of, y- some of y'all grew up in the old church. God said it. I believe it. And that sounds, and then, and then we matured a little bit, so we took out the I believe it part, because if God said it, it really don't matter what you believe. So now it's God said it. That settles it. But some of us, we're not even there. It's, did God say it? Because it seems to me. (laughs) Y'all okay? Love break. I love you. (laughs) I love you. I love you so much. Just give your neighbor a high five. Love, (laughs) a word that comes and goes. (laughs) Do people really know what it means 
to love somebody. Oh, love, love you. Come on, keep doing it. Tears may fade away. Love you, man. I love you. God, love you, man. Glad your love will stay. Because I love you. Jesus, what it really means. So, James number two, James writing from a Jewish perspective, emphasizes living out one's faith, regardless of circumstances. Apparently, early Christians and us, we late Christians, aren't too dissimilar. We still need reminding that faith without works is dead. Okay, that was one of his big statements in this letter is, y'all are talking all spiritual. But where is, the, where is the action that backs up the spiritual? Oh, I know y'all can see we have a problem with that. We, I mean, we have a problem with that. Some of, I mean, it, you know, our, our overt spirituality doesn't necessarily mean that that's translated into a loving action of obedience. Not obedience, again, that saves us because we can never obey good enough to save. I always want to make sure that's said over and over and over again. But James is exhorting Christians to go beyond now. You say what you say and, 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 and press on into, listen, I tell my wife and children I love them every single day. That I, at least I try. I love you, sweetheart. And I, my babies, I, I needed them here every day. Love you, day loves you, day loves you. But I, gotta, I know I got to back that up. I got to come home. I got to work hard. I got to pray for them. I got to pray with them. I got to teach them. I got to correct them. I got to roll around the floor and play with them. I got to let them pile on daddy. Any of y'all dads know what I'm talking about? Pile on dad. Hop on pop. Y'all know what I'm saying? Where you got bruises everywhere. And they're like, get daddy, get daddy, get daddy, get daddy. Anybody know what I'm talking about? <laughs> I know what I'm talking about. And, you know, and my son just, you know, the cannonball, you know, the girls have me down on the floor. And Jonathan, you just hear this. Woo! Oh, son, Jesus, a word that comes and goes, hop on, pop. So you really, so I mean, all you got to do, all that's rolled in. It's got to be more than just talk. Okay. So James then is saying, listen, despite the persecution, despite everything going on around us, all right, Nevertheless, walk by faith. Live this out regardless of your fill-in. Number two, circumstances. James Adamson, in a wonderful commentary, writes, James is addressing people who are supposed to know the rudiments of Christianity. And his aim, as in the Sermon on the Mount, is to set forth the theonomic life. Now, that's a, that's a term we haven't covered, but it really means a life lived by God's law. Okay, so we may have to you know, deal with that a little bit in James chapter 2. But it's a life lived by, by God's law. And anytime you say law in the New Testament church, everybody gets uneasy. What we're referring to is the moral commandments. Okay? Does that make sense to you? I mean, is adultery still wrong? Is lying still wrong? Uh, should we still honor our parents? Is it still wrong to bear false witness? Okay. That's what we're referring to. That's what we're referring to. So, uh, so that's what he's trying to do. He's trying to encourage them to to put some work behind their faith. Uh, therefore, James, like Paul, is, is practical, maybe a little bit more practical than Paul, uh, and his goal was to help the, uh, the sincere or the Christian live up to their faith and very often to correct their errors, misunderstandings, and backslidings resulting in conduct unworthy of the Christian life. James, as you'll see, makes no provision for the culture, makes no provisions for contextualization, blending in, or any other buzzword. On the contrary, James calls Christians to be Christians and the church to be the church. My, one of my great sins in ministry um, early on particularly is I really believe that the church was not supposed to stand out, but was supposed to blend in. I've long repented of that many, many times. Just, I just got it wrong. How many of y'all ever just got something wrong? Wave at me if you just got something wrong. I, it was just, I was just wrong. You know what? It takes a lot of maturity, by the way, to say, 
Now, I'm not building myself up, but it took me years. But I mean, it does take, it take, takes maturity to say, I just blew it. I was just wrong. I was just flat wrong. So that's all it is to it. I'm sorry, even to this day, you know, because the, 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 the church is not by, by, by virtue of, who, of, of what we're called. Again, Ecclesia called out through every scripture you can name through an examination of the two covenants. God calling out Israel, God calling out the church. God always has a people he calls out. Oh, hallelujah, somebody. God always has a people that he calls out and says, I want you to do this differently for my name. And I'll, you will be a city on a hill. You will be salt in the earth. That means you'll be a preservative and you'll make people thirsty. I'll, I'll, I mean, I'm not going to put you under a basket. I'm going to call you out and then I'm going to shine a light on you so that people struggling around in darkness look up and they see the reflected, reflected glory that comes from me. Why? Because you don't blend in. You have been called out. That was a great sin of mine. I'm so sorry. Because we're not called to blend in at all. We're peculiar people. A holy nation. And we're supposed to look not in an arrogant, self-aggrandizing way, but in a, in a way that simply says you're different. So something, the family is different, the conduct is different, the ethic is different, the, the joy is different, the feel is different. Listen, I, I want you all to go into environments with humbly and meekly, but everybody go, something has just changed. That's the anointing that must have came in with you, I guess. I want that to happen. I want it to happen. I want it to happen in my life. I don't want to go in and the same dirty jokes are continuing to be told. I want, I want to, hey, how's everybody doing? Everybody, shh. Okay. What? what? What's wrong? Y'all all right? No, we just wait until you leave. <laughs> that's good. That's, that's supposed to be, that's supposed to happen. That's not bad. I mean, you, you don't want, oh, you don't want someone to say, hey, come, Rev. Rev, we was at the club last night. When you come in, Rev, I know you be getting it down, baby. <laughs> that ain't supposed to happen. Right? And it's, you don't, you're don't you not mean or anything like that. It's just you're, you've been, you're called out. You're different. You're, you're, your children. How many of y'all want your children different? Let me, let me take a poll. How many want your children to look like, sound like, be like, think like any other child anywhere? Anyone? No. No. You want them to look different. You want them to sound different. You want them to feel, you want them to, certainly want them to think different. You want their, their, what, what comes out of their spirit and then it makes its way to their mouths to be different. You want them to speak forth the words of the Lord, don't you? So James makes, you'll see, he makes no provision for all the stuff that we value so highly today. He's not, he's just not, he's just not there. He's just like, no, this is, this is, we're the church and we're supposed to be the church. If you recall, Christ birthed the church with his own blood. So James, as a result of that, James is often accused of lacking grace. Like Paul or lacking love like John. But like all scripture, his writings are complementary, not contradictory. We'll see that. Complementary, not contradictory. And oh, by the way, I want to show you something because this thing with grace is important. Grab your Bibles real fast, quick detour. Turn with me to Titus chapter 2. Grab your Bibles. Everybody have a Bible? If you don't, you wave your hand. One of these um, strapping young gentlemen will Run quickly and get you one or look on with the nice Christian beside you. Titus 2. Everybody with Titus 2. Titus 2. Titus 2. If you are seeing First and Second Timothy, just go a little bit more. If you're in, you see Hebrews, you went a little bit too far. Titus 2. Titus 2. Verse 11. Everybody there? Close, close, close. Okay, I want you to see this because this is, this is important. Titus 2.11 says, For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all people. In context there, uh, we're, we're, we understand all to mean whether you're slave or free, Jew or Gentile, whatever. Okay? So the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people. Verse 12 is key, and it's similar to Romans, 12, uh, Romans 6. 
What does grace do? It bring, we're saved by grace. Somebody say we're saved by grace. But here's what else grace is supposed to do. Verse 12, grace then trains us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age. You know, we, 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 we just got to, we have to understand this, this, this thing of grace just a little bit more. Grace, after we are saved and brought into the kingdom, that same grace begins to train us. Train us towards what? Train us towards holiness, deacon. It's, it, you know, the grace of God saves us, and by the grace of God, he teaches us. And so when we are learning stuff, just look at your name and say, that's grace. That's, that's the mercy of God. That's the power of God. So just want you to catch that real quick because, you know, you could mistakenly think James has this really tough edge, but truthfully, it's hard to think of a more loving message than thus says the Lord. Okay? So let's look at uh, just one more, and then we'll get some the key verses. We'll, then we'll, we'll uh, share the Lord's table together. Um, number six. Note James's humility in the first verse. If you look at the first verse, again, in James, note his humility. Note his humility. Even though he's a relative of Jesus, he calls himself a servant, even though he had risen to the leadership of this church, uh, even though he was James the Just and all of that, a servant of God and a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. You know what? Just as a man... I'm trying to, I don't, I mean, I have a little brother. Um, I'm trying to imagine saying, that's my Messiah and King. How many of y'all have siblings? I mean, can you imagine the maturity that you've had to press through so that you wouldn't, so you could see him properly? So I love James's humility. This is such a humble place. So I just want you to know the, the epistle starts out with a, with a great display of humility, where, where James, even though he was walking in this familial relationship with Christ, had been so transformed by the Spirit of God through his conversion and growth, James, a servant of God and a servant of my, of my brother, no, I didn't call him that, a servant of who? Of the Lord, of the Lord Jesus Christ. Huge, huge. And so lest we think this man is Connor Gruff, very humble guy, okay? Now, here's a couple of verses like we did in 1 Corinthians. We, we yanked them out and just some things to start thinking about as we walk through the epistle, doing the same thing here. Uh, 1 Corinthians was uh, the first time we had done that, so it worked out, and I, I thought it was good to just give you an overview. And so we did the same thing here. We'll run through these very quickly, but I thought that these were key verses. You might come to some different conclusions as you read through James, and you may find a few that I didn't mention. We'll eventually, though, by the grace of God, cover all of them. The first one is the one we'll begin to cover next week and a favorite uh, amongst many, many Christians. James chapter 1, verses 2 through 4. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. Anybody struggle with doing that? My first inclination when I run into a trial is not joy. I mean, I, I look at this verse and go, nope, fail right. I mean, I fail. I mean, I might work up work to get there. And then the elder, somebody has to come in and remind me, remember, remember the joy? Oh, yeah, yeah. But my first one is to kind of get attitude or to feel sorry for myself or to feel like I've been treated unfairly. Am I the only one in the room? <laughs> Count it all joy, brothers, when you meet various trials. We'll start working on that next week. When we meet various uh, kinds, trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness, and let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. So as we did in 1 Corinthians, we'll pray again, Lord, help us to learn to count it all joy. Allow us to regain the Jesus is enough perspective that having you is all we need. And that despite any and everything going on around us, you are still God. Hallelujah, somebody. Help us to be steadfast. And through this perspective of being steadfast, realize that we lack nothing, that we lack nothing. 
So we'll start working on joy next week, and we might take us a couple of weeks to really unpack that. Uh, a lot of us, our heads are down, and um, no reason for the two Christ on the throne. So we're going we're gonna to hopefully encourage everybody next week in this whole area of joy. Uh, James chapter 1, verse 22, number 2. Um, it's a good thing joy is coming because <laughs> he gets right back to business. Deacon. <laughs> be doers of the word. Are y'all with me? But be, you know, I always get King James here. But King James puts a ye in there. Be ye, praise the Lord, but be doers of the word and not hearers only. We kind of mentioned it, deceiving yourselves. How many know it's one thing when Satan comes in to try to deceive you? It's another thing where you bring deception into your own. Well, that's what happens when we hear. Don't do. So the prayer then, Lord, deliver us from this very common deception, that of self, that we can hear the word, say amen to the word, and not keep the word. That's a deception. Deliver us from that. Deliver us from that. Everybody has a touch of that. Deliver us. Help us. Uh, number three from James 1, 27, a very important verse. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction. And we need to draw some conclusions there. And to keep oneself unstained from the world. And we'll draw some conclusions from there. Lord, show us how to use our, our time and our talent treasure to consistently help those who are hurting. And I should have written there and help us to fight against our worldly impulses. Uh, number four, and we're almost done. I wanted to kind of finish up a little early. And so we have a little time for fellowship and the Lord's table. So, uh, but number four comes from James chapter two, verse one. Really need to pray through this one. My brothers, show no partiality. As you hold the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. Contextually, it's referring to people coming into the assembly of different means, different kind of socioeconomic brackets. Big picture principle is anytime we choose to look at somebody else in an unbiblical manner just because of their race or their financial status. And uh, so we, we're going to have to, it, we're going to take the, the opportunity, given in light of all that has occurred in America, we're going to take um, the opportunity when we get to James 2 to really pray through and help the Lord, and ask the Lord to help us deal with classism and racism. Because both are evil. Just as evil as they can be. And uh, I don't care what side you're on or what, what shade you is. One blood. One blood. Okay? One blood. We trace all of our family history back far enough. You know who you're going to find? Adam and Eve. And before you get to them, somebody related to Noah. Okay? So one blood. And so we need to really do our best to kind of move past some of the evil here, and it's just sickening. And um, there's just no place for it in the church of Jesus Christ. Rich or poor, black or white, we are all precious. <laughs> I was hoping somebody would catch that a little quicker. I, I did change it up. That was a remix. That was a remix. All right. <laughs> So we're going to work on that. And the prayer, though, is, Lord, forgive us for the sin of partiality. Cause us to see one another the way you do. James 2, 17. So also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. And we just want, we don't want dead faith. We want a live faith. We want a faith that speaks. We want a faith that lives out. We want a faith that forgives. We want a faith that loves. We want, we want, we, I, mean, I mean, anybody know what I'm talking about? I mean, I want to jump out in the morning. I don't want a faith that holds grudges. I want a faith that forgives. I want a faith that blesses. I want a faith that takes on demons and devils, not in my own power, but in the power of God. Hallelujah. I want a faith that preaches. I want a faith that when it's all crumbling down, we are not giving up. We count it all joy and we do what God has called us to do. Got to get a little of that because our heads are too down too long too often. So we want to, mm, we want some of that. Some James is going to help us. Faith by itself, if it doesn't have works, is dead. Lord, teach us how to walk by faith. James 3 and 5. 
So also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great things. How great a forest is set ablaze by such a small fire. O oh Lord, show us how to honor one another with our speech. James 3.16, for where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder and every vile practice. Huge verse, really challenging the Christian to examine themselves for motives that are impure because jealousy is not an outward thing. You ain't cuss nobody out but it's still in there. And I believe the sin of jealousy is one that we don't talk about much, but it's one that does more damage than we think. A lot of us, if we're not careful, we can fall into the sin of jealousy and actually what's motivating our dysfunction is what somebody else has or what somebody else seems to be enjoying. And when that's there, I mean, look at the, look at the scripture. All kinds of foolishness breaks loose. Uh, selfish ambition, same thing. I, I, it's not, it's not, not to us, Lord, not to us, but to your name. It is to me, Lord, to me. What's in it for me? And that's like the modern church, you know, theme song. What's in it for me? That sounds good, but it didn't meet what I. Yeah, that's what the Bible says, but it's not what I. We do this more often than we think. And our motives are much more focused on us than we think. So expect some challenge there um, and some self, a good time of self-examination. I hope it, we're, we're blessed by, by it. Prayer is, Lord, help us combat our fleshly impulses and to walk by the Spirit. If we do that, that's fixed. Um, James 4.4. 4. <laughs> yeah, this is Pastor James. This is Bishop James speaking here. You adulterous people. <laughs> James could get away with that. I couldn't. You adulterous people, do you not know? I mean, adulterous here is in the context of idolatry, by the way, not like physical adultery with a man or woman. But you adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. So what does that say for a church who spends millions, if not billions, trying to befriend wickedness for the sake of the gospel. We're actually undoing the power of the gospel to bring the initial conviction and then see transformation. We're actually working against the gospel. When the church loses her prophetic voice and people know, you know what? Uh, part of, remember we said that the church, one of the, the function of the local church, the function of the Christian is to be salt and light. Well, what does light do when you're in darkness initially? When you got up last night in the middle of the night or you got up this morning, somebody turned the light on or whatever, what happens? Your eyes have become, y'all, are y'all here? Hello? When it's pitch black and you go into a lighted place, your eyes have become what? Adjusted to the dark. Somebody, you know, your, your pupils, I believe they, they open to get as much light in as possible because it's so dark. What the reason was, so when you walk into a lighted room or somebody turns a light on, or if you're in a house like mine, your children bust in. <laughs> right, right? The reason why it hurts is because your, your pupils need time to bear down, to come in, to not let as much light in. Right now they're open. All this light is coming in. It's painful. I don't, I don't, I don't, you know, what does salt do? Okay. If it's, it does many things, but it's, for, it's supposed to be a preservative, but it's also supposed to produce thirst. The church has an obligation to understand this. And if we don't, we'll fall right into the trap. And it's such a common trap. I, I'm writing, a, I wrote about this in a book. Y'all have heard this before, but it's this whole misunderstanding of what love is. The church is supposed to, listen, if you're in the darkness and it's lit up in here, guess what's going to happen regardless? It's going to hurt for a minute until your eyes adjust. 
if you're thirsty and you get around us and don't even realize how thirsty you are, we're going to make you more thirsty. And hopefully you'll reach out for living water. See, that's what's supposed to happen. It's what's supposed to happen. It's part of why the church is here. The church is here not to become friends with the world so that our presence does nothing but affirm the world. Are y'all hearing me? Listen, please listen. This is so important. The ch- that's, not, that's not even our function. The church is here so, the, so the, there's always this tension between church and world. It's supposed to be that way. And if it isn't that way, there's something wrong with the church. Or either all the world has gotten saved, <laughs> or there's something wrong with the church. So James here, he's going to call, he, there's this call. For, don't, he's telling his flock, listen, we're not, here to, we're not here to pray footsie with the world. We're here to do as much love and grace as possible, pull as many out as we can. So that's we, just as we were called out. So... Lord, may you be first in our heart and minds, and may we make no alliances with that which displeases you. None. May we make no alliances with demons and devils. None. I don't want to be in any kind of contract with a devil. I don't want the devil in my Blackberry. Yes, I still carry a Blackberry. I don't want his number in there. I ain't trying to get no text messages. I don't, want him, I don't want him to follow me on Twitter. No friendship. None. None. Now, do we wade in and grab folks with, with a, and put a life preserver around them and help them come out? Oh, yeah. All day, every day. But then to lay down and become like the world system? No, ma'am. And look, either say amen or ouch or something. But that's, that's really what James is saying here, all right? So look at the uh, second and last one here, James 5. Be patient, therefore, brothers, unto the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, being patient about it even or in, until it receives the early and the late rains. The prayer, Lord, help us develop these inner virtues because this is, gonna, this is a lifelong fight. So help us develop these inner virtues like contentment and patience and grant us a sense of peace until you come. In the midst of all of that, there's still this wonderful peace that sits them on a, on a Christian. In the middle of the worldly fight and all that, there's still this joy, this peace, this grace that sits upon a Christian as we await the coming of our Lord. And we're going to talk about it. And then lastly, uh, James 5, 16, just giving you an overview. Uh, Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. That verse alone is probably one of the most, that's a direct command. And it's probably one of the most ignored commands in the modern church. Because when was the last time you walked up to somebody and said, I need to confess a sin? First of all, we don't even call what we did a sin. (laughs) CRCC, are you with me today? Are you here? Look, we don't even, we don't even, because that, we don't want to do that. You know, I've been having some things. (laughs) And, you know, it's been, I've been going through, I've I've been kind of working, you know, and there's some things. You know, but, but based on your attitude, was it, was it biblical or unbiblical, right? If you've, been, if you've been mean and standoffish and ugly, what do you call that if your children do that? Those are sins. So th- this is why we don't walk in healing, because we can't go, you know what, here's my sin. Here's where I I believe I sinned against the Lord, first of all, and then by extension, I think I did you wrong, my brother. I think I sinned against you here. That's my confession. I'm asking you to forgive me because I shouldn't have rolled like that. I love you. And so we can't get there. Therefore, we we can't even get there in our marriages. And so a lot of marriages can be healed like today. Look at your neighbor say today. Look at somebody say, I'm going to say like Pastor Jamal, right now. Look at your neighbor say right now. That's North Carolina, like Lisa Jamal, right now. You can be healed right now. It ain't got to be in account right now. You can get a healing. It ain't got to come this week right now. It ain't got to be in account right now. North Carolina, Pastor Jamal, right now. You can get this thing right, just tell your neighbor, right now. You can get it. Here's the secret. Husband, I love you. I love you, Jamal. You're my pastor. You're my brother, man. 
I sinned against you. Oh, no, I just did it. I'm so sorry. Please forgive me. <laughs> but here's how you want, it, you want the secret married people. Here it is. Husband, wife, I sinned against you. And of all people, you're the one I should not be sinning against. I confess that I have been choop, 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 and choop. Would you forgive me? Sweetheart, I absolutely forgive you. Here's my list. I've sinned against you. Because while you were ba 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 ba, I was choop, 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 and choop. Yeah, you sure was, wasn't you? I was, I was. I forgive you. You forgive me? I forgive you too. You love me? I love you too. Take it from my brother with a happy marriage. Okay, I'm just trying you know, to say uh, 22 and a half years of joy, unspeakable joy. Joy the world can't give <laughs> and the world. <laughs> so, <laughs> but so, so there's a lot here that we can unpack because we don't, we end up with these shallow Christian relationships. I and mean, we never kind of press into this place of just real showing of healing, y'all, where we just, uh, and we're in there, we're there, you know. And it's such a wonderful place that we can get there. So the, the Lord is going to, I pray he helps us there. So a couple more prayers and we'll shut it down. The final prayer, number 10, was Lord totally transform the prayer life of CRCC at home and in church. Help us to take the step of confessing our sins to one another as we pray for one another that we may be healed. And that's, and that's huge. I mean, if all we get out of James is James 5, 16, we will be a different church on the other side. Um, so how might CRCC be changed because of James? Just a few more thoughts uh, and prayers. One, let's pray that our zeal to obey the Lord, which is a key theme, theme in James, will be matched only by our zeal to love one another. So our obedience and our love just track side by side. That would be great. Number two, that... Um, we would again see the call to obedience as a loving response to a loving God. Not some kind of legalistic mean thing, but just we love him so much we just want to do what he said. Real simple. Number three, that we would practically change. We'd see notable, noticeable shifts in our walk and talk. Number four, that our patience would increase with one another um, as we wait for the coming of the Lord. Number five, that our resistance to the devil would increase. We'll talk about that in James because he tells us, he admonishes us to resist. And uh, so we're going to figure that out. Number six, that our generosity would increase. You know, we've been, he's going to admonish us to take care of the widow, right? To visit the orphan. Number seven, that we should rise up in faith and put that faith into practice. So uh, may the Lord do all of those things and much, much more. And may we come out the other side, change transformed and loving one another like we never have loved each other before. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.